Okay, so we're still letting people in, and I know that at least two members of the Darwin Board Maintenance Group are still Here's on their Tim. way. Okay. And Shelly says Peter's having some issues. Well, we don't allow Peter to come in. <laughs> I wonder if he knows he has to be uh, logged in to Zoom. I've got Peter on Sky on Slack. I'm talking him through it. Okay, we can wait that long for sure. Oh, brother, I see the Slack. I'm not sure how to fix this. Meanwhile, we seem to have a stable number of participants. So I'd like to ask a question of those here already, because there are some names I don't know. Um, for how many people is this the first time coming to a Darwin Core maintenance group meeting? If you could raise your hands and get an idea. Okay, so at least four. And perhaps more. Okay. Thank you for that. So um, I'll start with a bit of an introduction while we're waiting for others to come in, including Peter, who's pending, and maybe give Marcus during a bit of time as well, who's also on the maintenance group. Uh, I'm John Vichorek. I'm going to show video just for a short time because my bandwidth is limited just to show I'm not a robot. Or if I am, I'm a well done robot. Um, this maintenance group for Darwin Core is an institution set up in the bylaws of Tadwig for what happens when a um, when a standard becomes ratified. In other words, it's been accepted by the community, and then it goes into a period of being in use, hopefully. And to make it as useful as possible, a maintenance group, which is a specific type of interest group, is, is created in order to make sure that the usage of the standard and its evolution are taken care of. And there's a core group of people who do that, I'm one of them. I'm the convener of the task group. Steve, who's helping us host this meeting today, is another. <clears throat> Peter Desmet and Tim Robertson, Marcus During and Paolo Sermoglio are the others. What we do uh, as volunteers is to monitor the Darwin Core issue tracker for uh, ideas and comments and requests that come in about the standard, about the Darwin Core standard. And we also assist in the functioning and the attainment of the goals of task groups that are related to Darwin Core. So what I'd like to do is share again the in the chat for this meeting, Let's see if it's still here. 
no, that's not it. Um, I'll get it. Share. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Share the agenda for today because in it are a number of helpful links and some lists of things that we've been involved in and things that are ongoing. <clears throat> the helpful links are to the Darwin Core Quick Reference Guide, which is the basically the go-to guide for how to use Darwin Core in practice, let's say. It's, it's the simplest and most clear uh, portrayal of the standard. <clears throat> and from it, there are links to all the other relevant documents um, for the Darwin Core. There's also a link to the issue tracker, which is where we keep track of the things that the maintenance group needs to do. And it's not just us who put issues there, it's anyone in the community can raise issues, including uh, uh, requests for new terms or requests for changes to existing terms. All of that happens through the issue tracker. And within the issue tracker, there is a um, there are templates to fill in if you create issues for new or changed terms. Uh, an auxiliary site that we also that that we in the task group, sorry, the maintenance group, monitor is the Darwin Core Questions and Answers site, which um, has had an active period some years ago, very active period some years ago, where we created videos of webinars and presentations for things that came up in trying to promulgate how to use Darwin Core better. The site is still active, and it's a good place for people to go and ask questions rather than to raise issues about Darwin Core. If you, if you want to know how to do a particular thing, the Darwin Core questions and answer sites is the place to go. Uh, I think we'll remove the next line, which is not relevant to us now. So, <clears throat> but also by way of introduction, what I wanted to do is to talk about the things that we've been involved with and are basically finished at this point. To give you an idea of the scope of what the Darwin Core Maintenance Group is involved in. The first of those is the first of the, let's say, official ratified Darwin Core extensions, um, which is for chronometric age. The link is there. And the, the quick reference guide for the quick the chronometric age extension is incorporated within the Darwin Core website itself. When I say official ratified extensions, it, what this means is that chronometric age extension went through the process of uh, com community review and consensus building around a proposal for a what we call a vocabulary extension. So this really is a part of Darwin Core, but it was created under a task group that was specifically formulated to meet the challenges of missing terms when talking about chronometric age. And one of the products of that was a Darwin Core extension, the kind of extension that can be used in a Darwin Core archive and also can be <clears throat> um, linked in a functional instance, a production level instance of the integrated publishing toolkit, which is a tool for publishing Darwin Core archives from which GBEF and other aggregators can, um, can harvest or aggregate the data sets. So that was uh, <clears throat> one of the vocabulary extensions that has been done. Another was not an extension per se, but it was a, a creation of controlled vocabularies for some existing Darwin Core term, well, an existing Darwin Core term, and the creation of a couple of new Darwin Core terms related to invasive species vocabularies. So these are establishment means, degree of establishment, and path, or pathway, sorry, um, <clears throat> with actual controlled vocabularies that are part of Darwin Core standard as well. Most recently, 
we finished the work on the Mixus tax task group, which was a, to create a memorandum of understanding between TADRI organization and the uh, GSC for the maintenance of vocabularies that are of common interest. That is the Mixus vocabularies for genetic resources. So the memorandum <clears throat> basically states that we, the Darwin Core Maintenance Group, commit to making updates on the Darwin Core side whenever there are changes that are relevant on the Mixus side, and vice versa. That on the Mixus side, if there are changes uh, that reflect the mapping between the terms in Mixus and the terms in Darwin Core, that they will notify us, and we will also make changes on our side. So that really is uh, a, a first of its kind as well, um, a, a memorandum between two standards organizations about the co-maintenance of terms that are related to each other. So th those are things that have kept us busy in the recent past. <clears throat> There are lots of things that are keeping us busy now and are part of the reason why uh, we haven't moved forward with a public review on pending, open pending term requests, either changes or new terms in the last year. Basically, the people involved are too busy and part of the reason they're too busy is because we're heavily involved in this list of other task groups that are under the heading of what we're working on in the notes document for today, the link of which should be in the chat. So the first John, of those, I'm, yes. Astrid has a question. Okay, sorry, go ahead, Astrid. Hello, um, I'm Astrid schmidt and I'm working in Vienna at the Boko uh, University, and I'm taking over a little bit the work of Eike de Viva. I don't know whether you know him, but uh, he was uh, institutional in setting up this freshwater Darwin core extension. And I was just wondering when you now listed, it, listed the extensions, uh, why this is not mentioned here. So is was this ne never implemented? So is this still in a stage? Um, yeah, that needs to be worked on. Uh, I'm asking this because we uh, now will restart this work on the freshwater dubbing core together with Chibif. And yeah, I would just would want to know where we are or where I have to start or where I need to begin. Actually, that's a very good question for this moment because it helps to explain how, how the system works. So when I talked about the chronometric age extension, that was done basically by the rules, which was to create a task group within the Darwin Core Maintenance Group and with uh, with the EFG group, which is, uh, um, I don't recall what it stands for, but it's paleontology, um, be between those two groups to go through the process of creating terms following the methods and, and uh, patterns that are used for the creation of terms in Darwin Core. And to do that, they created a task group. So the task group had very specific goals, one of which was to create the vocabulary, much like the Darwin Core vocabulary with terms, their definitions, their relationships to other terms, Etc., and the other was to create an uh, an extension document, an XML document, that is the means by which GBIF is able to add the capacity in an integrated publishing toolkit instance to incorporate the data that are in the vocabulary. So GBIF has lots of extensions. And they're even called Darwin Core extensions, but they've never gone through this process, this public process through TADRIG. And I suspect I'm not familiar with the one you're talking about to know what its status is and whether there it's uh, something that can be used in the IPT or not. If somebody knows, please go ahead and, and tell us. But it hasn't gone through the process of uh, a task group to create. A Actually, 
actually we do have a list of terms and uh, I always uh, use this list of terms if people ask me to publish something uh, through the GBIF IPT that we are having. So I suppose it is, it is in, integrated in GBIF. <laughs> Uh, do we have confirmation of that in the chat somewhere? Uh, hi, John. Um, hi, I don't. I don't think there is a dedicated extension per se for freshwater. I think it was a guideline document for how to complete uh, content in other extensions. Yeah, but we also have a list of terms. Could you share the documentation for that, please? Uh, Astro. I've just right been through now. all the extensions and if you can find see... it, put it in the chat, that would be fine. Yeah. Yeah. I don't see anything specific for fresh water. Okay. That will help us answer what the actual state of it is and where to go from here. So on those same lines, we have active task groups that are trying to do something similar. The first of those is the Humboldt Extension Task Group, which is meant to uh, create a, a vocabulary of terms for ecological data sets. Um, that is a very active group and is in a testing phase. It's actively asking folks to um, to test the vocabularies with real data sets. And I'm see if I can see on my calendar. It looks like tomorrow at the same time will be their task group meeting. That's for the Humboldt extension. So if you're interested in that, please attend. Uh, the next one had its meeting yesterday, which was a material sample task group, also extremely active. Um, the the idea with that task group is to try to make better sense of the class material sample to define it better to determine what it really refers to 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 tackle what does it mean to sample and is that what this is really about or is this parts of specimens or what really is the scope of material sample with the added um goal let's say of determining whether or not the other terms used for basis of record in darwin core are in fact apt and useful or can they all be deprecated and and replaced by something better so we're, we're talking about terms like preserved specimen fossil specimen living specimen and their relationship to material samples. So that's what that group is on about. There's also a plant phenology task group, which uh, has not yet met in public either. And there was some confusion, I think, about whether that would happen this week or next. And officially, I think it's supposed to happen this week. And the status of that, so that to my knowledge so far is that it, it appears that through their work the goals that they were trying to accomplish can be met through the extended measurements or facts extension that was designed by people from obis the extended measurements or facts extension is something that is in production in integrated publishing toolkits, but it is not exactly a ratified standard. It uses ratified terms from Darwin Core, but then it uses some that aren't as well and does something interesting. I mean that in a good way uh, to bypass the limitations of the Darwin Core archive star schema constraint and allows measurements or facts to be made both on events and on occurrences. So that, that's what that is about. And the plant phenology people think that they should be able to use that to accomplish their goals. But the work is not fully done yet. Another task group that uh, I haven't seen a lot of activity lately, but I know that it's that their work is it's quite matured, and that is the how did it die task group. 
who are trying to um, to create control vocabularies and a vocabulary term at least for the vitality of an organism at the time that it was collected or or observed. So was it found dead on the road or was it collected in a trap, that sort of thing. So those are the things that have been keeping Darwin Core maintenance group people busy that are directly related to Darwin Core. There are plenty of other things keeping us all busy for sure. Um, and it's what has kept me personally uh, too busy to do what I really ought to have been doing in the last year, which was to spawn another public review of outstanding issues. So that's the thing that I would like to address mostly today um, in most of the rest of the meeting. But I want to pause here and see if anyone has any questions or any concerns or comments about anything that I've missed. If not, I can go right on to the issue tracker and, and show what it is that we, as a maintenance group, normally do. As a bit of history, this used to happen uh, in the evenings in the in-person Tadwig meetings and was surrounded by board games. Now we do board games online all the time instead, which is probably why we're not getting anything else done. Okay, so what I want to do is switch over to the Darwin Court issue tracker. And here, what I'll do is share my screen. Um, I don't want to say anything, but I have to say that I've had very good luck so far today with my connectivity. If I disappear, it's because of that, and I'll come back. Sharing my screen. Is it visible now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Looks good. Okay. So we have a dedicated GitHub site for the maintenance and publishing and updates to Darwin Core. And it is uh, it's linked in our notes document for today. What I'm on now is a page in that site, that GitHub site, where the issues related to Darwin Core are tracked. So if you're not familiar with Dar GitHub issue trackers, it, they're very convenient. We've set this one up to, uh, to be able to label our issues in a way that allows us to get at different aspects of the maintenance of Darwin Core. So I'll show you one of those. Uh, what I'll do is I'll select a particular kind of issue. The one I'll choose is the term add. This means someone has requested that a new term be created for Darwin Core. So I've opened that and what the situation is there is we have 26 open issues for new terms. And the status of those um, is given as another label on each of them, except where there's a new term type that hasn't been completely assessed by us. So if we look at the first one on the list, it's also the most recent one, it's for a new term called parent occurrence ID. And it's a term that's proposed for the occurrence class. It's a normative change because it's an addition to the standard. And its status is that it's in process, but needs evidence for efficacy. In other words, the people proposing it or others interested in its implementation need to come up with the evidence that this will actually work to achieve what it is that they're um, what it is that they're trying to achieve with it. That's not the only kind of status. That's sort of a, a blocking status. It can't move forward. That term uh, addition can't move forward until that issue is addressed. There's another kind of blocking 
status, which is in the next term, the term cast for you social organisms. Again, it's for the occurrence class. Again, it's normative because it's a term addition, but in process, there needs to be evidence for demand. Now, it may be that this evidence has come to light since the last time we've reviewed this term, and we can look at it and see and make a determination as a maintenance group whether that evidence has been expressed. And if so, we'll change the status here to move it along in the process. And then if we go down two steps further, we see the new term request for vitality. And with if you look at the labels for this term, again, it's for the occurrence class. It's normative because it's addition. But this one is ready for public comment. So basically anything that's in that state, we could, as a maintenance group, put together a public comment to try to accumulate all of the terms that are at this stage and try to get them ratified by uh, public commentary and public consensus that they are in fact uh, acceptable universally to our community. There's also a label for that one that says that this is related to the task group, how did it die? Below, you can see another one for material sample, which doesn't have a status yet, a couple of them for material sample and so forth. Further down still, I'll move it up to the top, is a, an issue, an open issue for a term addition for a controlled vocabulary for the occurrence status property. Now, occurrence status is a term whose examples in Darwin Core show present and absent. But the term is used in multiple contexts, and there are arguments in the community that presence and absence aren't sufficient for all of the contexts in which that term is currently used. So the issue here is that it's gone through a public review and it's been found to be controversial. So it's got the controversial tag added to it. And the decision by the maintenance group was in order to resolve that controversy, a task group ought to be created to get it solved. People who are the champions of, of having this control vocabulary created and have the time and energy to do so would lead a task group to solve the problem and then bring the solution back to the maintenance group here from which we would then take it on for public review and if successful and ratified into incorporation in the standard. So I think that gives an idea of the, the, the kinds of labeling and, and the process that we use for uh, resolving the open issues for Darwin Core. I want to go back one step and also show the list. First of all, we said there were 26. Yeah, 26 requests for term additions. Now, if I'm going to go to the term changes list and there are 34 terms here for which requests for change have been made. Um, so here we see something else, a, a new kind of label for the process and that is for this documentation about event date and event time. So someone has made a proposal here but the proposal hasn't followed our pattern, our, our template for how to submit these kinds of issues. So it's been labeled with process need templated change request. So it's here, the issue is created. There might even be commentary about it, but we as a maintenance group, because we have a lot on our plate, request that the, re the change request itself be templated like all others are, because that will facilitate its review. And without that, we basically say, if you don't have enough interest to take that forward into a template, then we don't have enough interest to move it forward within the maintenance group. We, we don't have the bandwidth to do all that, those things. So we do ask and some level of input from those who are submitting issues. 
Go ahead, Steve. And John, when when you uh, open a new issue, are you given an opportunity to select a template then? I'll show that, that's a good question. So uh, here on the issue tracker, there's a button for new issue. If I click on that, I get exactly what Tim was, or uh, sorry, J Steve was just asking for, which is the list of possible templates that could be used. There are two. There's a new term template and there's a term change template. And if I click on either of those, it will start a new issue, templated new issue using the requested format. There's also the option to open a blank issue if it isn't either of the other two things, if you're not requesting some kind of a change or addition to terms. So now I'll click on the get started for the term change template. And this is exactly what we would hope people to fill out so that it, the, the request looks exactly like this. It gives us all the information we need to move the request forward. And without that, it means we need to fill this in. And sometimes we do, if people want help to do that. Um, and sometimes we don't. So hopefully that helps to understand how that process works. Also, while I'm at it, I believe that at this, <clears throat> at the entry page for our GitHub repository, there's a readme on that same page that describes how to get started. It tells you what things are, what the structure of the repository is, and <clears throat> specifically how to contribute. And the how to contribute link is what describes the things that I've just been talking about. How do you propose changes and new terms and talks about the templates and so forth. So that stuff's all available in writing within the, within the site itself. Hey, John, can I just make a quick comment? Yeah. Um, yes, please. So what the process that John described is for like kind of simple changes where you're changing just one term, then there's a, a somewhat more complicated process. If you're trying to do like a, a coordinated change that involves a lot of things, then you're probably gonna wanna uh, set up a task group. So like, for example, those extensions or creation of a whole new controlled vocabulary. So those eventually will go through the same kind of like review process, but it's because it's a more complicated thing, it can't be handled by just opening something in the issue tracker. At least not by opening a new term request. However, contrary to that, we still do have this one that started out as a term change request. <clears throat> this controlled vocabulary for the current status property, and it has evolved into the need for a task group. So it started that way, but it might have, if the whole idea had been formulated at the outset, then the creation of a task group might have been the first step rather than the issue. I think that's what Steve's trying to get out here. Any other questions or comments about the process and how this, how we work when we're trying to resolve open issues? So thinking then about these two categories of term additions and term uh, changes, well, there are other issues that aren't in those categories that are to do with the maintenance of Darwin Core, but they tend to be problems that we, the maintenance group, need to solve. And so I'm not really interested in looking at those in detail in our time today. Um, but, but thinking about the a, an upcoming public review or public commentary period, basically what we have to work with here are 26 open term edition issues. And what was the number? 34, I believe, uh, open term change issues. So that's 60 issues which is actually quite a lot more than I would have expected, but it's because we waited a whole year 
before starting this process. And so what I'm doing, what I'd like to propose now is that we start an official process to, do, to incorporate these changes. The timing on that will be uh, that I can't really engage in it for at least two more weeks. At that point, I can start to put together the part of the process that we do um, on our side to make sense and make some order about this whole set of changes that need to be assessed, like grouping them together, the ones that are um, that are related to each other, and omitting the ones that have not achieved the, the necessary prerequisites in the process or moving those forward. For example, we might push on the terms that require a need of evidence for efficacy and make sure that that is, is forthcoming before going to public review to try to include that term in a public review. And the same thing for those that lack the evidence for demand. We try to go out and beat the bushes and see that if we can get the community support required to actually move that forward. So we'll do that after having made the list of all the terms that need to be worked on. And then once that's done, we'll, we'll start, we'll, we'll make announcements to the effect that we're going to go into the public commentary process. And the, that process is also very well defined. Uh, in a document called the Vocabulary Maintenance Specification, which is the only document in the Vocabulary Maintenance Standard. And if somebody could put that in the chat, if you haven't already, that would be awesome. Because that's an integral part of how we work, how, how Darwin Core evolves, is by using that standard. And within it, it describes how these changes need to be done in terms of public commentary, how much time is required for public commentary, what does it mean uh, to have consensus, uh, what happens if consensus isn't reached, all those kinds of things. So in practice, just to summarize how that works, uh, the public commentary is open, entirely open, and we publish it as widely as we possibly can to make sure that everybody who might be interested and see it and can contribute if they want. And it functions through this GitHub issue tracker uh, for the most part, but if there's anyone who's not comfortable, we also accept email uh, commentaries that we will include on the on behalf of the interested party within the issue tracker. Uh, so it's all public and the the discussion basically tries to con uh, to achieve a consensus within each issue separately, even though some of them might be related to each other. So we're we're looking to be able to put a label of consensus reached on each and every term that goes out to public review. The consensus might be to abandon it. The consensus might be that after a public discussion and some rewording and and some any other adjustments that are needed to be made that the final product of the commentary period is acceptable and then that can move forward to the final step in the process which would be ratification well it's not final <laughs> it's the next step ratification the final step would be actually incorporation of ratified um, terms into the standard itself. So if a term goes to public review and receives no, um, no dissenting opinion, in other words, nobody says there's anything wrong with it, then at the end of a 30-day period, that basically is, uh, reaches a status that it's, it's ready for public or, sorry, it's ready for uh, being proposed for ratification. If in the process of public review, terms go through a lot of discussion, disagreements and so on, but finally get resolved on some date where no other discussion occurs, then that state 
needs to sit open as a final proposal for 30 days to give people yet another chance to comment on it. And if it go, those 30 days go by and no one has a dissenting uh, opinion during that time, then it too can go to public comment. You can see that this ends up being kind of uh, kind of a horse race. And some terms get finished easily in 30 days and other ones go on under discussion for a long time. And part of the trick that we as a maintenance group need to straddle is getting terms that are basically stable out for use uh, with the terms that are controversial controversial so we as a maintenance group decide at some point listen we're not actually getting close to consensus here we need to label a particular term as controversial and let it go on to further commentary and and basically take it out of the race for ratification for the current pass. So anything on our issues list right now that has the label controversial was a victim of that in the last public review. The consensus could not be reached during a reasonable amount of time and we moved on. So some of those will need to be revisited now and some of them are entirely new. Um, there, I think that covers how the public review works. Anybody else have any comments they would like to add to that about anything I might have missed or that I didn't make very clear? Okay. So at this point, I'm hoping that it's crystal clear how things work. So what we can do. I'm getting an internet unstable thing. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you fine, John. Okay. It went away too, so cross my fingers that I stay connected here. Um, what I'd like to do then is ask if there's anybody among you who are here participating, if there is an issue that you have proposed that hasn't been addressed yet. We'll do that quickly. If there is, then we can look at it as an example. So raise, raise your hand, anybody? And if that's not the case, then we could also have uh, look at an issue that is a particular interest to someone and they're wide open. Anybody could raise their hand about any issue that they are like, that they like. It could be a term addition or a term change. If I don't see a hand for that quickly, we'll just John, go into the, yeah. I, I was just going to say that, you know, the, the low hanging fruit here is the ones that are marked ready for public comment. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we can uh, just, I don't know, review and make sure that's true, at a minimum, those could be ready to go, right? That's fine. I would have assumed that there's nothing we actually need to do. A review never hurts. And I know as a maintenance group, we would do that review before going any further. So I've clicked on that label, ready for public comment, and 19 of the terms are at that stage, which is fantastic. That means there are only, what, seven that aren't? Yeah, maybe there's so, nothing we need to do. <laughs> well, let's look at them. A lot of these have the label non-normative. So they're term change requests with changes that are in part of the term definition, not the term What's the word I want? Descriptions? Metadata. Uh, uh, metadata, there. <laughs> the term metadata that supposedly don't require a public review. However, based on our previous giant public review, as a maintenance group, we decided that non-normative changes would also go to public review unless they were just, you know, like typographical errors. Because sometimes our assessment of whether they 
are normative or non-normative is suspect. And it's better to have all eyes on the, the term changes to make sure of that. Also, it's not a bad idea to have the entire community aware of the changes that are that are coming or to even suggest better changes than the ones that are here. So that's why non-normative changes also go to public review, even though, strictly speaking, they shouldn't have to. So I'm not sure that any of these really require a review. If you think otherwise, go ahead and, and tell me. We can look at one of them. Here's, um, what did I just do over there? Maybe for a public. I'll go into one of them just to show the kinds of uh, so this is a is from Ben. So how's oh, yeah, everybody doing? Tossed. <laughs> Are you able to hear me? <laughs> yeah, we got you, John. Okay, excellent. Ben stepped in directly. Ben, are you able to share a screen and look at that term, or shall I share it? I can. I can do it. Yeah, you want to do it? I'll do it. That should be there now. Great. Okay. Yeah, yeah. If you could talk about this one, where it came from and where it stands yeah. now. Sure. So if you run down through the first order geopolitical divisions, there are 26 main types of geopolitical divisions. And very few actually have states, very few countries, other 204 countries. Um, and so there are more provinces, but still there are 26 different types of these things. So in my mind, it was there's a better uh, label to be more comprehensive and for you know different countries and places and things. So I proposed a different, it doesn't change the underlying term. I think that's a distinction, John, I'm sure will reiterate that it's just changing the label. And so the label will change something more descriptive, more um, it's really something that that's better describes the actual field, which is first order, first order division. That's what it is, right? Um, it just it's a better label for that particular term. It's more encompassing. Like, the, the words are there. It's it's early. You know, <laughs> sometimes it always get. But that's the idea. So I, I just I followed the template. I wrote down exactly what was needed to sort of justify this, and then I included some data and some examples and things, and then submitted it for a label change. And then I, I'm gonna do the same thing for second order division uh, soon because that's county right now, right? And so there are a lot more second order divisions as well. Um, and so I think that's sort of more, a better term to use for that particular field, for the label. So it doesn't change the term, so it doesn't break a whole bunch of things, right? Um, but it does change the label to what you display, like a human readable version of the actual term. Right. So this is a good example, something where someone has taken the energy through and proposed everything the way they ought to have done. And it's in a state where everything's in order and it should be clear enough that people can talk about it and just uh, discuss its merits and decide whether or not to go through with it. So, okay. Thanks, Ben. Sure. So, Steve, did you retract whether we should look? Further into the, you break it up. Uh, I feel, 
I don't think it's necessary to look at all of them. I, I guess I was just <laughs> I guess I was just kind of proposing that we uh um you know, I don't know, prop propose to uh officially move them to public comment. I don't think we need to talk about every single one of them unless right. people have ones they want to talk about. If there's anyone who wants to talk about any of these, that's perfectly fine. And I would then propose, as Steve just said, that we decide whether to take these to public comment. I, I vote. There any dissenting opinions on that? If not, I'll take the action then of just moving these forward to the next step, which means we can uh, focus our G on the state. So, so there are several. The most recent one and the most recently active one. The posters to shut term as proposed will do. While we're waiting for John to come back, um, would you like to ask your question, Camilla? Yes, thank you, Tim. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm planning to put uh, an issue, but I'm confused where should I put it. I'm mainly talking about uh, an issue between establishment means and occurrence status. Uh, in particular, our, our community is interested in documenting endem endemism of our species for a checklist, and we haven't found the right place to do so. And this endemism thing is very important for, for decision making uh, with the national checklist. We used to use establishment means, but now that the control vocabulary has put in place, well, there's no space for, for endemism in this. Um, element and I have seen there like last year there was a, a long discussion about endemisms as a part or occurrence status so I I will have to put an issue but it's not from a specific term but a vocabulary but this vocabulary is I'm not sure in which term to put it I, I don't know if I have been clear so I don't know which will be the best way to address this problem and to put it in the correct formatting so it's addressed by the task group Hi, Camilla. Yeah, Peter's just answered your um, question on the chat. Um, it would be a good place to start um, with the, the Darwin Core question and answer issues. And if you just post um, your problem statement, uh, someone will help uh, guide you through uh, where to put it. Okay, thanks. So it's not yet an issue for Darwin Core task group. It's more like a Q&A then. Yeah, I, th I think if you just get the discussion going um, and get the background for, for what you're trying to do and why, um, we'll make sure that it gets put into the right place. Okay. Thank you, Tim and Peter. Uh, and thank you. Thanks, Steve, for sharing. Is, can you hear me or am I broken up? We can hear you, John. Okay. Sorry. Sorry about that. It's very frustrating for me because I can see the ditch outside where I'm sitting for the fiber optic cable, which will arrive next week. <laughs> oh, well. Um, were there any other open questions that I missed? I, 
I think I heard all of what Cami was saying, and I agree with the, with the solution to that. Okay, so what we're concerned with going forward are not the uh, terms or the issues that are ready for public comment, but the ones that are not. And there are at least two categories of those. The ones where evidence of demand hasn't been met, and I think if we can look at that one first, it would be best. <clears throat> so this is one, there are 16 in this category. And our assessment is that although the proposal has been made uh, and the template has been filled in and so on, it has come from what appears to be a single party, a single interest, or it's at the level of an idea. Now, I'm not saying that that's the case for all these, but it's the, the state which they were when we last assessed them as a maintenance group. Now, I'm sure some of them have gone beyond that, for example, CAST. So if we can look at CAST, I know that there's been further commentary and what we would do as a maintenance group is decide whether the, there has been demonstrated sufficient uh, independent interests to move this forward. Now, I followed this one on my own, and I know that, in fact, there have been lots of additional um, organizations who have said, look, yes, we need this too. We're in agreement about the addition of this term. So based on my history with this, with this um, term request, I would change the label now to say that it's ready for public review. Um, I can't make that decision on my own. So it's something that we would have to assess as a group. So there are many that are in this stage and CAST is one of them that I think is ready. Um, it's not, I think, a really super good use of our time to be able to look at one or two of these and, and get them, get their labels changed uh, in this context, in our, our public context that we have right now. Um, so I'm not sure where to go with these. If, if anyone has a suggestion, that would be welcome. Maybe if we can look at the list again and. Hey, John, any, um, can, can you yeah. just elaborate? Like, I think the criterion for the evidence for demand is that at least two independent groups need to indicate that, right? And so, it, yeah. it, like in the case of CAS, um, there's the proposer and then here's another independent group, I think, indicating that they need it. So it may be that we could just quickly go through the issue tracker and see if there's someone else who's put something in there. And if that's the case, then we would just change the label, right? It would be awesome if you, that seems a reasonable thing to do in this context. I'm happy because it moves us forward and moving us forward is really what we're on about. So this one I have seen, and yes, it needs does not need evidence for demand. So if we can change the label for this one to move it along to the next step in the process, get rid of the needs for demand and move it to, I believe it's ready for public comment. Okay, we accomplished something. Steve's good for that. Um, I mean, maybe we could ask if anybody is aware, rather than like going through all of them, right. if anybody's aware of ones that have had that sort of discussion, we could jump straight to those and at least knock those off. Mark is here. Uh, I have a few taxonomic terms like super family and tribe that are kind of stuck in that uh, needs evidence thing. And I'm sometimes a bit unclear what is a group <laughs> so if like if catalog of life for example uh, i don't know i'm probably pre representing catalog of life but then if donald hoban with his own data set which 
he is part of catalog of life is he in you know, he's probably treated as the same group so um i find it quite hard sometimes to see what is the same group of <laughs> or not even though we're like different people and yeah. slightly different but kind of reconnected so you can probably see them as one big cluster but that case for example is submitted by someone else and Yeah, and it's easier when it's quite clear that they're two independent mm -hmm. parties as opposed to when it's when they're not clear that they're independent and it's very subjective. Um, Marcus, with respect to all the pending taxon related, basically entries for different taxon ranks, do you have a, a sense of whether there's interest in basically being complete and including all of them? I think so. I mean, we did do subfamily, for example, as far as I'm, I thought that right. is part already, isn't it? It Just says put the, open. Put, put the link in the chat. There is um, superfamily, subtribe, and subfamily. And there has been a few closed uh, not too long ago because of lack of demand. Um. Personally, I think superfamily is the most important one because that's really very, very often used. It's a very high, it's probably the most commonly used rank outside of the Linnean classical ones. Um, and tribe is probably not a really important one. But you could go through them and accept or have a proposal of all the sub ranks basically for the Linnean ones. So I don't know. Personally, I think I would at least do the super family and tribe ones because they are at the bottom of the classification where it's more important to have a bit more of a finer granularity. But um, I'm just wondering. My recollection with, with... was that subfamily has support as well. Right. Well, we can ask another question. Erica brought up the, the point that, you know, two. Two people who seem to be independent saying, yeah, we need this um, is represents a smaller community than uh, organized. Subfamily uh, sub is, is already part, is already ratified. So I'm wondering why we have that open actually. But that has been, but it went through last year, I think. Can I maybe offer something right. as an alternative? is to address all of these with one issue, to add all of them at yeah. once. Suborder, yeah. infraorder, subfamily, superfamily, all those sort of secondary tier. Because they have, I mean, certain yeah. ones like superfamily are very important to mammals and infraorder, suborder are very important to reptiles kind of stuff, right? Um, and it seems like yeah. one issue that just knocked them all out at once would be fantastic. And it would be more consistent than having just one rank in there. I don't know. I, I would highly support that. And I think that that's, that conversation started in one of these infra rank discussions and that's why it got stalled. That's why that particular issue got stalled. But I, Ben, I think that's a great idea. I don't know how, what the best way to propose that is. I think from the standpoint, I mean, these are each new term. Uh, I mean, we could create like a milestone that would group them, but from the standpoint of documenting what it is that we want to have happen, I think having a separate issue for each one is maybe necessary. I don't know, what do you think, John? Yeah, we went through a, this very issue some time ago. And what we decided as a principle for our, our means of maintenance would be that we would track each term independently with an issue. That doesn't mean we can't do other things to facilitate their uh, organization, like an issue that combines them and describes them as a whole, or as, um, as Steve was recommending, in a milestone. So I think having had that decision, that maintenance decision in place for some time, and having it be useful to make sure that we've got things done <laughs> correctly and completely to maintain this single issue per um, per term, but think about other additional 
ways to make it to facilitate their review. Do you recall why it's important to put them in separate issues? Because the justification is almost the same for all of them. I mean, they're different reasons. They're important to different communities, but. Um, I mean, the I, I think main of, one. Go ahead, Steve. Well, I was just going to say from the stamp at some point, like when we get to the actual grunt work of, yeah. of moving these changes, you know, we have to copy and paste definitions and things into a spreadsheet that's going to be used to generate the document. So it's, it's really just a way to make sure that we have all of the pieces necessary and that we capture the exact change that was suggested or or all of the metadata in the way that it was reviewed because uh, i think when you lump it all together then we we've gotten down to the situation where when we're at the point of actually implementing it then we realize like oops we forgot to consider this particular thing then we have to go back and and try to recover that so i think it's really a kind of, it it's maybe not the best thing from the standpoint of this part of the process, but from actually handling the implementation of it, I think it's more helpful. But I was going to say, there's, it helps with the rigor of getting the term correct and complete for inclusion. Um, uh, it also okay. avoids the issue. Can I finish with this one or something yes. else, Steve? Okay. Um, no. It also avoids the issue that if one of the terms does end up being controversial it doesn't hang up the other one if they're grouped somehow um i, I was just going to make a comment about this the requirement that two independent groups um show a uh, demand for it i mean it when you have like what is the purpose of the standard it's for transmitting information from one place to another. It's not, although people use Darwin Core as like a means for organizing their own internal databases or whatever, that's not really what the standard is for. And so, you know, it, if, if one large group uh, wants a term, then the question is like, who are they transferring this data to? Is it gonna go between them and GBIV? Is it going to go between them and consumers? And so I guess that's kind of the rationale. So if you have a, a lack of demand, then ask the question is like, well, who else is going to be involved in a transfer of this information and get them to go to the issue tracker and say that they need it? Yeah, exactly. Oh, a hundred percent, Steve. My perspective is almost that the process by which two random individuals indicate support is not evidence for demand because the this um the guidelines say groups and so you know in the tablet community there's plenty of individuals that you guys all know each other whatever you you go back way way long times um but for newcomers like we don't necessarily know who a certain individual that might have like a great idea and um, on their own be able to pull that evidence for demand card. Um, so it's a little unfair to feel like you're coming in, you represent a group and that doesn't count, but random individuals do. So I think the standard should be to, to actually have two groups versus two individuals. I agree with that. And I think we try to implement it in that way. If we're failing in that, I want to know about it. <laughs> My question was just, what is a group? Because, you know, when we work with ITIS, uh, Kew Botanical Gardens, Missouri, and Australia, and all kinds of different institutions, but they all share with GBIV and Catalog of Life, do they all count as one? Probably then. Right. Right. And that is um, a large chunk of people who actually make use of taxonomic data at all um, and it's quite hard to find someone else outside of that community if you basically take every taxonomic yeah you know. yeah yeah i see that um on the flip side the the principle upon which this is based is that we want dharma 
Concord to be as stable as possible. So we don't want terms to be created on a whim. We, we already suffer from terms that got created without having uh, without having foreseen all of the potential issues in the future. Well, that's fine. That's progress and evolution and so on. But we want to try to avoid that being disruptive, you know, adding terms when everybody, when, whenever someone has an idea. So that was the principle upon which it's based. So one thing could be, since we have such a protective review process in place, that maybe this evidence for demand is less important than what used to be, or that we ever thought it would be. The issue there is that a term can be proposed and it can be done well, and it can be done by one person or group, and no one else has any interest. So it, nothing happens in the commentary period to that term, and it ends up being implemented when it was just a pet idea of someone or some group. We want to avoid that happening too, based on the, the principle, the foregoing principle that I just described. So there's where the subjectivity comes in. You know? Is this really going to result in the sharing of data? And I think in the case for, that Marcus is talking about, absolutely yes. It's, you know, the terms of, that are taxonomic, that are being requested by various factions within the whole, are really, really because we want to share data. So to me, subjectively, that, sh that fulfills the requirement, the ultimate requirement. Maybe we should think about restating this, this uh, evidence for demand. And get around the stumbling blocks of what does it mean to be a group or independent or all those things. And really ask the question does this mean data are going to be shared more than they were before between people, not just publishing? So it looks like Erica supports that. And I, I think it's not a bad idea because we've had this discussion multiple times now and i don't want people to have to stumble i want this to be clear we have other support for that in the group i mean i guess it just means we have the maintenance group is going to have to make a more subjective judgment on this it's like a less mm -hmm. objective criterion than being able to identify two groups so i mean i'm not necessarily against it, it's just going to make it a little bit less straightforward to decide. Um, does it suggest that we should rewrite anything about how to engage in the process? We should look at that, I guess. A new issue to look at what it means to have evidence for demand is probably in order here. I mean, maybe as a part of the, um, you know, the tracking of the issue that there, that there should be some kind of statement of the evidence for demand. <laughs> and that would allow the maintenance group to evaluate that um, in, in the form that the person who is saying that there's demand is making the argument for it. I didn't say that very clearly, right. as opposed to having some yeah. kind of strict rule where you're just check marking off. Here's two people who say they want it, um, you know, have some kind of statement of the sort that Marcus gave about the number of people that are involved, the number of uh, participants in the group or whatever. And that would be provide the support for evidence for demand. So don't take away the requirement of evidence for demand. Just just say that there needs to be some kind of statement indicating that that support is there. Steve, can you open a new term issue and see if that's sufficient, what's in there? So there's a demand justification in the first part that the submitter is supposed to fill out. Is that what you're talking about?
I don't hear anything. Are, yeah. are you still there? So yeah. to, to me, it sounds like it, it is that one. I uh, yeah, sorry. see that all, I, the, that all the issues I've uh, created didn't have that in place at that time. So there was just a general justification uh, at some point. So I think mm -hmm. with that separation here, I think that makes perfect sense. I unfortunately was muted when I was talking, but I guess uh -huh. I was just suggesting that we could still have this and just put in or and then or elaborate on the justification or something like that. I, uh -huh. I think expanding that just in the issue template. Um, rationale would be helpful. I'm thinking like it's really hard to get users of Darwin Core to get in in the Darwin Core GitHub issues and create issues. And so anytime they do and then they get a negative response that like sets us all back. Um, and I'm thinking in particular of the verbatim label issue that happened mm -hmm. last year where the evidence for demand was very clear. There were three groups, but it got flagged as a label with needs evidence for demand. And it, it just like the evidence for demand um, wasn't the right label to add, but there was like a, a need to have a more conversation about the issue. And so I, I wonder if there's a way to, you know, you as the maintainers do need a way to say like, ah, like, do we really need this term? Um, but we, we wanna do that in a way that, that doesn't feel like community members who are new to Tadwig are just getting, you know, slapped in the face for not doing things the right way. So I have a comment about that one. Verbatim label, I remember very well. Um, the labeling of it in GitHub is that it's ready for public comment. Uh, and if I remember correctly, there's probably some evidence here in the issue that the evidence for demand was something that, that it had to begin with. It was a a challenge that had to be met to begin with and as you say that was kind of as as a person submitting it that must have been seen as uh like a slap in the face <laughs> to say it blithely um but the process was followed and the evidence for demand was met that went to public review, but then it got labeled again after lots and lots of public review as being controversial. If I'm not mistaken, yeah. So that was August of 2021. It got labeled as controversial. And so that got people talking some more and some more. And it was never really resolved. The, the, um, the controversy state where, uh, no, I'm mistaken, the, the controversy presumably was resolved in commentary following, and the, the controversial label was removed. So that one went through the process it was supposed to have gone through and reached the current state of being ready for public review once again. But I understand what you're saying, that that initial kind of back label uh, of needs demand or needs something could set back the submitter and we need a, a friendlier way to solicit contributions because we really need it. You know, we need this stuff from the community to make our own core better. Does that summarize things well enough? Yeah, a hundred percent. And so I thought all the conversation on that issue was really great. And like, that's what we would love to see for lots of these new terms being proposed. Um, yeah. And it's just so hard to get, you know, a collections manager that has strong opinions to get on GitHub and share those opinions. And, you know, for the verbatim label, like, I don't think Tommy's ever going to like propose a new term for Darwin Core again, or, or you know, so I, and this is, not a problem that we need to go down a rabbit hole on, but it's really hard on the social side of things. And, and you guys are doing so much work already as the maintainers that um, I just wonder if there's any little verbiages that we can do to help prompt people to um, understand the norms easier, if that makes sense. And I don't know if in this case there is. 
Well, we can change our process somewhat too and be more engaged, you know, rather than just going through and labeling, saying, no, nah, you didn't do it right. Actually say, before doing any labeling whatsoever, try to communicate with those people and say, look, this is how it's supposed to be done. Can you take the next step and, and try to do this thing that is missing? Or is there some way in which we can help you to accomplish that? That would be, I think that would go a long ways towards solving the issue you're talking about. Okay, so I, I'm getting that as a positive. I at least can commit to trying to do that because I, I hear what you're saying and I felt really bad and lots of people felt really bad for Tommy. He did so much work and I just kept getting all this controversy. <laughs> he went into the Tadrig rabbit hole. So going back to Marcus, um, let's let's get those terms that are in that taxonomic category and basically on hold changed over to um, to to being ready for public review. If there's nothing else holding them up, the public review will decide whether or not they're wrapped. There are these four. We can do that right now, actually, if the, unless there's some uh, dissent about doing that. So are we basically just saying that, like, uh, through this discussion, we think there's evidence for demand? And should I go in and change the labels? I believe there is. Marcus, you believe there is, no? Yeah. The, the subfamily ones, I think we could just close that as a... Uh being done right that's still open so we, we have to tidy that up it's confusing to yeah. anyone to know what's wanted on that issue now Sub subfamily is in darwin core yeah that yeah. shouldn't be there that that's an oversight that one that's because that issue is from 214 so i think that is just an old one that we haven't closed yeah uh, it was so... closed it was reopened oh And what's up with that? I'm trying to look at it over here. Um, uh, one question: What is this process equal a uh, process dismiss tag? I'm not familiar with that. Uh, that the term request was abandoned for lack of interest. Okay, so which one of these should I change the labels on? Subtribe and superfamily? For sure, subtribe and superfamily. And then, Marcus, did you say tribe was still of interest? I think so. I mean, if you have subtribe, it makes, I find it hard to have a subtribe term when you don't have the tribe. I mean, yeah. Yeah. It's a bit so odd. let's get rid of the label on that one that says dismissed. It's just basically what happened was there's no activity in that in that uh, issue, I guess. Right. Yeah. And then okay, that cleans that up. And then super family also ready for public comment. Yeah. Get to the bottom of what happens here with sub family. Okay, so should we just hold on to this for a future investigation? Uh, if it's something we can resolve quickly, that would be great because it takes care of this entire group. 
I, I can't see anything in that issue that is, I mean, the only open thing in there is maybe my comment that there's a whole list of ranks that should be separate issues. Right. So there's nothing holding right. this one up. Uh, it looks like this one never was. Oh, no, it was. It is ratified, so. It was never closed, is all. Yeah, I think it's just an oversight that we haven't. Yeah. Can you change the label on that one, Steve? So, I mean, should we just change the label to ratified and close it then? Yes, please. Process complete is the label for that. And Ben, are you still there? Yeah, I see yours is all there. Um, I did see county level, a uh, county level issue already in there. Oh, I did? Yeah. Okay. There might even been one at the municipality level. Uh, okay, so Rian still needs evidence for efficacy. Right. Oh, need evidence for demand. I don't know if there are any left. So I'd like to I'm not sure I did this. Okay. Uh, reiterate before we go, which we'll have to do here in a moment, that my intention is that within about two weeks that I'll start up the process of organizing all this for a public review the way we did last time, because I think that worked pretty well. I'll follow the same pattern. Um, and maybe even before that, follow up on some of these that look like they still need some input from people before they're ready does that seem okay sounds good john yeah i think we can scrutinize these a little more but there's a lot of them with the ready for public comment tag now so lots of them yeah The ones that say needs task group are probably not something that we can get into this round, but we can uh, we can announce about them as well. Announce again that they really can't move forward without a serious investigation. And some of them are still in progress in their task groups, like the material sample stuff. So I think that's it for our time. We did accomplish some real stuff and we got new people introduced to how we do business here. Um, are there any questions before we stop the recording and head off to board games online? <laughs> okay. If not, then thanks a John, lot for John, all the support and John, patience. John, Go ahead, Tim. There's yeah, yeah. a question from uh, Ming on the chat. Okay, reading. Maybe not entirely related to public review process, but may I know how closely the task and interest groups are working together? For example, does biodiversity data quality interest group, task group four, that's the one on vocabularies of values, uh, involved in the issue is a control vocabulary values for a current status material sample type, et cetera. The answer is that the, the same people who are leading that task group are on the Darwin Core maintenance group uh, core membership. 
So practically speaking, yes. As a rule, no. It just happens to be that we, the task group members here, tend to be involved as much as we can in all of the things that affect Darwin Core. So the practical answer is yes, but I don't think there's any formal commitment to doing so. And I think the that task group is really about um, best practices for creating controlled vocabularies, whereas the actual making of the sausage is being done by task groups like material sample type has been discussed a lot by the um, material sample task group, which, as you say, involves maybe some of the same people. Right. And a current status requires a task group. So once that happens, we'll definitely be involved. Okay, I think we're good here. Thank you for all the help and patience with my connection.